So here we have key discussions by bringing together payment leaders and influencers to explore mission critical topics and address points with the ultimate goal to accelerate financial inclusion. Welcome once again. My name is Jeremy Quino and I will be moderating this session and I also happen to be the country director for Jumo in Ghana. Now Jumo is a fintech that partners with banks and mobile network operators to provide innovative financial services to the mass market. And I am joined by all you highly esteemed and seasoned panelists from various industries who are sure to make this a truly insightful discussion. Our topic for discussion today, which is using technology to unlock financial inclusion in Africa, is a critical topic of discussion globally. Financial inclusion is a critical part of Africa's sustainable development goals and poverty alleviation initiatives. And we believe that at its core, financial inclusion is fundamental right. However, right now, financial services and products aren't really being as expanded at the rates that we would like to see. And there still remain some challenges and barriers for excluded population. Over and above being a telco, we, we do put a lot of emphasis on mobile money now. Uh, which is financial services. Um, it's gone beyond, you know, just the ability to send and receive money. Now, most of these, of, of course, have moved into the advanced financial service range from utility payments to merchant payments, as well as um, savings and loans. Uh, not only are we being inclusive, we want to uh, drive literacy, financial literacy, we want to drive partnerships. Um, it's something that we've been doing over the years and we will continue to drive as well. Two of our main sectors of focus are financial services and technology. And I would say the bulk of our involvement in, in these sectors is actually trying to make sure that capital gets to where it's needed. And um, historically, if you look at, you know, look at the way capital or lending has been going on in Africa, it's been dominated by traditional banks. Um, and one of the things we've been trying to do, champion, is to support a lot of new techniques um, and new, newer types of businesses and companies, whether it be digital lenders, um, whether it be payment companies, uh, you know, trying to make sure that we can support these companies, give them capital. So, because we often find that these, these newer technologies allow them to sort of leap ahead and, and make ensure that the capital that's needed by SMEs or individuals gets to them quicker. We also, one of the things we also try to do is to also measure the financial impact um, and the positive impact that happens on the back of um, financial inclusion. The, the pandemic has actually made financial inclusion, uh, it, it brought it forward. And I, I see this deeply more and more, especially um, where we see, where we also had to work with uh, the multilateral organizations and donor organizations uh, through the pandemic to make um, financial services available to people who are uh, excluded before. And we did that working with them. We also got them included by bringing them into the formal financial services and then empowering them. The things that um, we are focusing on uh, from an architecture perspective are things like we need platforms that are cloud first. Cloud first because we need to be able to, to run with hyperscalers. If you look at um, uh, what we've had, uh, when mobile money, for instance, started 10, 12 years ago uh, in Uganda, we had a subscriber base of less than 1 million. Now you have 7 million active every, every month. Now, so you need an architecture which is able to scale from an infrastructure perspective. As your customers grow, as the services they use grow, you need to be able to scale. So one of the things we look at from an architecture perspective is that we need to be able to be cloud ready across the footprint. The ecosystem is for every single player to play the parts and then to actually make the contribution as much as they can. And that's what we do uh, with uh, Standard Southern Bank. And NIC Mobile has been the, uh, the driving piece of this even since we launched. I mean, today, we, out of the nine countries that I just mentioned, we, we were able to actually open up SE Mobile on all these nine countries in the space of about 15 months. And uh, in every single country in Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and uh, Zimbabwe, Uganda, all these nine countries, 
partnership and uh, playing into the ecosystem. That was the um, the driving uh, the driving kind of agenda that we've been playing on. The financial service providers are doing their part and have opened their minds up to the partnership. And you can tell that from the the MNO point of view, there's a lot of investment and focus and prioritization going on in that, where all of these players want to come together in order to play their parts. Now, this is not going to be done in isolation. You definitely have to do this within an environment, and this environment usually are regulated. Regulators sometimes take longer to predict where technology is going to go or where innovation is going to go, and it's always a sweet balance. You, If you have an overactive regulator, they can actually stifle innovation. If you have a regulator who is not also, um, you know, um, very active, they can also, in a way, um, allow innovations to actually um, um, run, run amok. And so, essentially, you need a regulator that's properly engaged, properly resourced, that they understand what they're doing within the market, they know what is happening on the regulatory front, and so on and so forth. Fortunately for us, I think uh, most of the markets that we operate in, regulators have been very forthcoming. Um, they've been, in, in a lot of ways, they've been quite humble um, to learn from the markets um, in terms of what is happening. There are a lot of um, stakeholder engagements around that front. I think the best form of regulation when it comes to um, um, innovation is actually offering like some kind of guidelines rather than trying to be very strict on acts, acts of parliament or acts of government because those take time to be able to change. Whereas in, in guidelines or directives, there's some level of discretion that is often there. And so regulators that are very um, 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 forward driven um, see innovation as a positive and not see it as something that is fighting an existing structure. But I think one of the very progressive ways regulators have sometimes dealt with these things is working with existing partners, in our case, um, something like mobile money that have always been in the market um, that is heavily regulated, at least with the regulation that is given, there can be some kind of self-governance or self-regulation, even within as an ecosystem level. I think the only additional point or misconception that we see is, or I think that we need to drive as uh, financial service providers and in driving financial inclusion is, how do we drive the benefit um, instead of really drive, talking about cost? Uh, all of this is to the benefit of the customer. I know we're all out there um, doing businesses, but however, the, the key that we're driving or the point that we're driving is how does this person understand um, the service that they're getting? What benefits uh, is it to them? And, and how do we make their lives uh, better? Essentially tailoring the products to the customer segment and make it relevant. Make sure that there's interoperability for, for ease of transaction. And then, like Daisy said, drive the benefits just so that the customer is the focus so that they understand why they are getting this. As much as you want to make sure that it's cost efficient for the customers in these inclusive markets, and that is why we're leveraging these technologies and all, we do understand that in order for them to be banked sustainably, it has to be essentially profitable for the institution providing that funding, if in this case it is, like yourselves, the financial service providers. For financial inclusion, the demand side drives the supply side. When that happens, um, it becomes sustainable over time. And again, what is put in into the infrastructure setup um, in terms of digital financial services, in terms of how customers are onboarded on the platform, those are vital things to, to put into consideration. One of the things we also found out is that those the, finance, the, the customers in this space we're talking about, they actually prefer having some bit of interface with humans than just the devices. So um, it's okay to start with that human phase and then graduate to the digital financial services, which we know with time and scale is going to be much more sustainable and uh, make the business grow. It's all about win, win, win. So I use win, win, win three times because the first one is for um, the customer, the second for all the stakeholders involved, and the third for the regulator or whoever it might be in the, in the chain. You're trying to move away from people going into branches, but supporting these initiatives with the human touch of, say, for example, um, calling up the customers regularly to let them know 
um, that you're seeing, well, you, 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 you're, you're aware of what's happening with their account, whatever deadlines they have, um, confirming transactions and things like that. Might sound that it's an extra expense, but those are the kind of things, the additional touch which um, that we've seen can make it really, really, really make a difference. You know, when we look at these things, we're always conscious of, uh, unfortunately, what could go wrong, right? You know, is this technology the right technology at the right time and the right place? Um, what, are, what are the regulatory risks? We spoke about regulation earlier. Um, does the regulator understand? Um, what are the potential new entrants to the market? Yeah, you may have spent, you know, spent a couple of million dollars launching this thing. Is there a, you know, is there a moat around your business? You know, if one bank launches something, could five or six other banks suddenly launch that same product and, and effectively what you thought were you, you know, you know what you thought you you had a unique edge, is not your edge anymore. In terms of um, the, the 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 actual product cycle itself, and then customization of product to the market, one of the things is making sure that there's enough research constantly with a customer, making sure that you can speak the customer's language and then um, having the right um, um, polls and tests to be able to um, identify when maybe customer needs have changed and then come up with the right product fits as and when, you know, um, 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 one, customer gets more exposure, is better educated and now needs more sophisticated uh, or, or more, more sophisticated services is really um, um, important. There are always specific products that should be developed um, um, for, that, for those segments. And every player must look at it like an, as an ecosystem um, 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 approach in terms of developing customers, onboarding customers all the way to sustaining a um, very healthy um, um, ecosystem um, um, for the partner. Like Arnie said, the business case has been made. And from what we've heard from John Daisy, the technology is available, right? We've heard a lot of the technology aspects in terms of the platform-led model, big data and, and API and partnering. We've heard from, from John Charles about how we need to all understand that we each have our part to play and there is no one owner of the customer and we all have a responsibility to do this. Also from Ebele is that the technology should be harnessed as a tool and we shouldn't just assume that the, the scalability is going to be there right off the bat and we need to make sure that we're making products that are relevant to the customer and are scalable and we've heard about how to make sure it's customer centric both Kayode and Daisy have harped on that essentially start off with what the customer wants and needs and what is relevant to them in terms of how they perceive the product in terms of value and then work backwards towards the product and finally from a sort of pseudo regulator Arnie how it's important to have that sweet balance between um, a regulator and that sense. So I think all of these come together to sort of make the point that technology can be further used to advance financial inclusion, but there has to be a lot more customer centricity because technology is the tool and not just the strategy. And we also have to make sure that we're focusing on the long-term lifetime customer um, value in this sense. In this space, it's an ecosystem. So I wouldn't be able to do services like bank to wallet or wallet to bank without you know, UBA, Standard Chartered and the rest of the banks. Um, I don't have uh, the, the propensity or the capability to do lending at the moment. So I partner with the likes of Jumo. Um, so we will continue uh, to work with uh, partners, reaching partners to open our platform um, via you know, open API that John Mark touched on. Uh, we'll continue to provide not only for consumers, but, you know, now there's a lot of SMEs. Someone talked about, you know, market traders, um, the women in the villages, different people doing different businesses. Uh, so how do we, as you have rightly put it, continue to look at that? Um, and I believe, one, yes, we can do it uh, in our own little cocoons, but I believe when we look at the ecosystem and the platforms that we have built, uh, we'll go further if we go together. We should be ready uh, to collaborate and also to compete. Our collaboration is on building the rails, the infrastructure. I talked about um, things like uh, cloud fast, hyperscalers, that's really sharing infrastructure. So our regulation should be able to allow um, us to, to do things like in, uh, in the cloud. Now, um, building the rails, I uh, see in collaboration, if you are going to achieve things like interoperability, uh, building interoperable instant and inclusive payment systems is expensive. So banks, telcos, 
all financial players um, with the regulators need to come together and collaborate on building the rails that drive interoperability. Uh, and then, of course, as businesses would compete, um, we share the infrastructure, but we would compete favorably on the applications um, and the accounts. That's where the, 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 the customer focus uh, would differentiate what Stanbic, Standard Chartered, or EcoBank, UBA uh, provides versus what MTN or Airtel and Africa provides. So we can compete and together drive value uh, for all our customers within Africa. So for me, technology is very critical um, on every of the things we do because we need that for scaling. Uh, mobile first is a strategy that will have to be at the forefront because with mobile, looking at that age band is something, I mean, that has to be reckoned with. Um, there's huge proliferation of mobile right now across, uh, across the globe. So for me, that is very, very critical. Um, the second one I want to talk about is regulation, regulation, regulation. Engagement with the regulators is very important. We talk about sustainability, but I will also say the business cannot survive without the right regulation because regulation can come with a policy that will take everything down the drain. So it's important to engage regulators, carry them along because we know sometimes they are not ahead as they should. Um, and we've done that at United Bank for Africa across various countries where we, where we do business. And we've seen uh, improvement and um, I mean, the way the regulators work with us has significantly um, changed. We are all here today. The telcos have a role to play. The fintech has a role to play. The investors have a role to play. The customers have a role to play. The regulators have a role to play. And all have to work together to make financial inclusion um, a, a, a force to reckon with in years to come. Financial inclusion methods and approach in order to change. But I'm very hopeful that uh, today in the front of Africa, we had about 25%, even 35% when you include the telcos in terms of financial inclusion rates. I'm very hopeful that with everything that we've done today and all the financial service players that are playing today, we should be able to reach that rate of by 60 or 70% in the next five years or so. So that's the, that's the pitch that we're going through. The growth in the banking, in terms of the revenue lines of banking, the biggest points for growth is actually within the payment space, which is mostly um, an area that you know fintechs have played an important role. And you look at a you look at a place like Africa, um, where payments seems to be the thing that's driving a lot of the innovations, a lot of the developments we see. Um, the point for me there is, you know, it's, it's quite a great opportunity we have. Um, to be able to make a real big impact in driving financial inclusion um, across Africa. Um, collaborations would definitely be key. Um, there are multiple strengths that we've learned over the years and where the legacy frictions have emerged and, and we know where these things come from. I think there are, in, there, are, there are refined models around how we work together. I think that a number of amazing insights have been shared and it's really great to have the different perspectives because it all brings it all to the, the four where we can basically make improvement.